Yeah. All no right. One. Yeah. Okay. Second attempt. Good morning, everybody. We have today the, the pleasure and the honor to have a, a guest lecturer in our seminar. This is Professor uh, Murat Chetin from Istanbul University, one of the leading experts in the field of our subject of the seminar. So we feel very honored to have him here to uh, hear his contribution. His lecture is entitled Architectural Space as an Agent for Establishing an Idea Through Making Cities. That's a long, long title, <laughs> but <laughs> it is very clear at the same time. Um, yeah, maybe uh, Dr. Evin Erich wants to say a few words. She knows him much better than I do, so she has more to say, I think. Yeah, but it's very Thank difficult uh, to do, to introduce uh, Murat Chetin by fee, few words for me. He is also a very important figure in my career. Uh, he is an architect and academician who is uh, specialized in urban issues, uh, urban morphology, urban economic, social, and politic, political uh, subjects. And he worked uh, in very University uh, universities in Turkey as well as uh, Saudi Arabia, and he participated in various uh, national and international competitions, in many of which he was uh, rewarded. So it's short but strong, I think. Now I leave the uh, uh, leave the floor to him. Excellent. After Turkey, we are together in Germany too. Yes, yes, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to see you again. And uh, the honor is mine, uh, Dr. Fine. Thank you for inviting me and giving this opportunity to meet with you, with your students. And if I can contribute to this class, uh, the content of which is very interesting and very important. So thank you all uh, for attending and for listening. Uh, I'll try to share my uh, presentation, first of all, if I can manage, if you excuse me. Um, yes, I think I will manage. Uh, I hope yeah. it is visible. Here it is. So I'll, it is. Uh, I'll try to, is it, is it better now? Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, as Dr. Fine said, uh, the title is long, but I hope it is really clear uh, that we're, we're going to discuss architecture and urban space as an agent for establishing an idea, uh, which I uh, have learned that you discussed before. Uh, and establishing this idea through uh, making buildings or cities or spaces. So that's going to be our topic. Um, so the, the, the main focus is uh, the space as an agent for establishing an idea. And I will carry the discussion from here uh, to establishing an ideology through space and architecture. So in terms of this relationship between architecture and ideology, uh, the outline of this talk uh, will be twofold, actually. In the first part, uh, I will discuss uh, the relation between architecture and ideology and how architecture or buildings and spaces uh, are kind of uh, instrumentalized uh, to implement an idea and thus ideology. And in the second part, uh, on the request of uh, Evin, uh, I, I will try to discuss the relation between uh, two realms, uh, the Germany and Turkey, uh, and their architecture. Uh, although I'm not an expert in this field, I mean, I'm not an architectural historian, uh, and uh, I believe you will have other guests who can discuss this matter in much more detail. Uh, but uh, I will uh, try to uh, comment, in, interpret uh, the issue of how and why did the paths of two different cultural uh, and thus architectural uh, realms, uh, German and Turkish uh, realms, overlapped 
uh, at the early phases of the 20th century. Uh, and from the perspective that's in establishing an ideology. Uh, so we, let's start with the term idea and how it will turn into ideology uh, etymologically. Uh, I will start. Idea uh, is a thought, uh, whereas the ideology is this thought uh, somehow processed, organized, configured, regulated in a social, economical, philosophical, and political systematic framework. So in that sense, ideology, again etymologically, uh, accommodates two roots of, the, of two words, idea and logic. Uh, so here, I will make an association uh, with the concept of language which again accommodates ideas and a logic of linguistic logic uh, in both a spoken and written format. So uh, physical and uh, audio uh, format. So it's a systematic. And uh, in that sense, it accommodates uh, the components of semiology and linguistics. The first one of which addresses the issue of meanings and the other addresses the issue of rules, systems, etc. So the first uh, includes signs, symbols, etc. Whereas the second one uh, accommodates syntax, grammar, uh, etc. Uh, in that sense, uh, if I'm, I will try. Yes. Um, in that sense. Uh, these two systems, oops, sorry, I, I, yes, how this uh, notion of language is translated into physical environment, uh, I will try to reduce the concept uh, because we have a limited time here, but uh, it is translated into physical environment or into urban and architectural theme uh, or uh, space in terms of uh, semiology of environment and linguistics as architectural linguistics. And uh, I'm sure all of you are somehow familiar that uh, the topics like architectural iconography uh, falls into the category of the semiology of environment, whereas architectural sim symbols, space syntax, shape grammars, etc. all these uh, subtopics in architecture uh, fall into the framework of architectural linguistics. Uh, and if we can try to visualize these uh, topics, uh, first we can talk about the linguistic part and that uh, somehow addresses to the um, thinking mechanisms, rules, systems, uh, reasoning of uh, the knowledge, the epistemology of architecture. Whereas uh, the semiology or architectural iconography uh, is more related to the uh, emotions, uh, feelings, uh, five senses, memories, uh, beliefs, etc. So these are the more, let's say, abstract issues of human uh, conception, human thinking. So architecture somehow, uh, architectural language somehow addresses uh, these two uh, realms and they are, of course, interconnected. And that's the key issue uh, because the semiology part addresses the issue of perception, which uh, is directly related with the senses and the body. Whereas the uh, second framework, linguistics, is more related to spatio-physical configuration or order. Uh, and in that sense, it relates to the mind uh, rather than body. Uh, so, and the interaction is crucial. And that's, I think, the key uh, concept in uh, architecture and architectural design. 
So that's where the idea, at least the architectural idea lies. Uh, and uh, I believe, and I will discuss, uh, especially today, that that point, that uh, interaction point, which uh, embodies the idea, uh, has so uh, deep roots, so archaic roots in humanity and its existence on Earth. Uh, and this existence, via settlement forms, uh, expresses how uh, humanity exists in the world, how it relates itself to the nature, to the cosmos, uh, to the existence, in other words. So, uh, since this point is critical, I think all the uh, ideologies uh, addressed to this point. That's why uh, leaders are always associated with uh, architects in history. We can discuss about that and we can see many examples of that. So in that sense, uh, if we go back to the issue of language, uh, all languages, both in uh, spoken and especially written form has uh, some characteristics of uh, their architecture as well. I mean, uh, if, you, if you look at here from left to right to from Hebrew to Arabic, uh, the form of uh, these uh, alphabets, these languages, even their syntax has some sort of uh, association with its uh, architecture. So it's a cultural issue. Uh, it's culture specific uh, information knowledge accommodated both in language and in architecture. And that addresses, uh, that carries us to the idea behind. That's what we're going to explore uh, today. Uh, so from uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs to our uh, emoji language, uh, today uh, that we uh, quite often use uh, are again uh, associated with uh, architecture. So this, this current language of emo emology, let's say, uh, has again its own culture and we can ask about what this culture is and we can answer like consumerism, uh, liberalism, capitalism, whatever we call it. It, it accommodates an idea behind. So both its language, language and its architecture has the idea behind, uh, but uh, therefore an ideology. As I said, today's consumerism uh, refers to the idea of capitalism. So idea and ideology and uh, their reflection in form of architecture is obvious and uh, it was there in every uh, era in the history of humanity and human settlement. So, uh, as we said, today's culture and today's ide ideology is about uh, consumption and uh, explo exploitation, whatever. But now, today, we will discuss how ideology is, uh, in a reverse manner, forms the social order by using uh, the spatio-physical order, which is the uh, architecture itself. So here we have to understand how spatial norms are utilized to establish a social order. We'll see the examples of that. Uh, regarding that ideology, politics and architecture, uh, there is a famous word saying by uh, Churchill, an English politician in history, you might know, uh, we shape our buildings thereafter they shape us. And uh, I will question that. So uh, if that accommodates, uh, there is a link between architecture, our buildings, and an idea. And Churchill's uh, statement suggests that it is a two-way stream. But I will discuss uh, that is itself. Uh, and I will discuss those in power shape our buildings and cities, and thereafter they shape masses of people. 
so uh, I will claim that it is a one-way street. Uh, but we'll discuss about that. So, uh, as we said, uh, ideology via architecture shapes the social order. And th there is a massive literature about that. I will just put uh, one as a symbolic example so we can discuss about that literature later. Uh, and in this link, if we remember the perception and uh, spatio-physical configuration, first of which addresses the senses and the body, the second addresses the mind. So in this link where the idea and ideology lies, uh, we can say this idea is all about uh, how to distribute power, which is the essence of politics, uh, the social order, and how to organize the public sphere for this. So these two issues, how to distribute power and sources, uh, and how to organize the public sphere along with that. So that's what the ideology is all about. Uh, and here we can come to our point which is the public sphere, uh, public sphere, public space, urban space. These are different terminologies, but somehow they are related and they form a uh, scale uh, range. Uh, but I will discuss uh, the literature of public sphere, especially in its relationship to the modernity project. I think that's the key issue we have to discuss here, modernity and its relation to how public sphere is conceived with the modernity. Uh, in that literature, uh, the three main pillars uh, are uh, Arendt, uh, Senate, and of course, Habermas, uh, and their uh, seminal works human condition, uh, the fall of public man, and the public sphere, the structural transformation of public sphere uh, by uh, Habermas. And all, the majority of literature refers to uh, Habermas, although uh, their literature, uh, their uh, books uh, cover many issues. And if you look at them, they address uh, the subject of politics, actually. I mean, I'm not going into the details of every book, but they discuss about public sphere and all their other works are about the politics itself. Uh, totalitarianism, blah, blah, blah. I mean, if you look at it. But uh, among those, uh, Habermas, with the structural transformation of the public sphere, uh, still is the major source for discussions about public sphere. And uh, that's the original. Uh, and I do apologize from the beginning for my uh, horrible pronunciation and misspelling uh, in German. I'm sure you will excuse me, uh, especially the term uh, Offentlichkeit. Is that, is, is that correct? Or maybe you can uh, pronounce it uh, correctly. So that, that one uh, is, uh, in literature, it is referred as a normative principle and the de democratic ideal uh, in relation to the modernity project. Uh, Habermas was seen in this public sphere as a normative principle and a democratic ideal. Uh, in that sense, if we look at the word, uh, it is directly related to public sphere. Uh, how it is related. The, the first part of the word, often, uh, is associated with the words like open, clear, accessible, common, uh, free to criticism, etc. And when it is uh, often like, it's public, shared, and common. And when it becomes uh, public sphere, often, right? Publicness, publicity, public realm, public space, public sphere is uh, kind of accommodated within this concept. So 
uh, if we uh, go to the issue of distributing power and organizing the public sphere in relation to the uh, assumption of uh, Churchill, uh, the public sphere and uh, public uh, space, and in that sense, urban space, are uh, totally related of uh, defining how to organize the social order uh, because uh, public space is the main agent if we come to the beginning main agent main instrument of this normative principle and the democratic ideal how democratic it is we can discuss later uh, but now i am coming to the issue of establishing social orders many orders there are many orders via architecture uh, so let's remember where we are within our uh, outline now we're discussing uh, the relation between architecture and ideology how architecture uh, is uh, instrumentalized uh, let's discuss how this system uh, operates uh, this mechanism operates i think there are two uh, sub-mechanisms uh, operating uh, in this uh, system of establishing an idea through architecture. The first of which is the materialization. The second is crystallization. I will talk about that. Let's, let's start with the materialization. Uh, what, what do I mean by materialization is uh, the processing, uh, making, transforming of materials on earth uh, and turning them from, uh, let's say, liquid to solid, from abstract to concrete. Uh, in that sense, from ideas to matters, uh, from ideas to bricks and mortar and building in space. Uh, and that is a very natural act. That's what I'm going to explain. And it's like an embedded or coded information when we are born that we come to the earth to transform these materials and to create our physical environments, which defines our social orders as communities, as species. Uh, like many species on, uh, on earth, we do very similar thing. I mean, we kind of see ourselves as above all this, but we're not really very different from other communities. Uh, and we produce these uh, elements, the matters, which we transform, uh, and we live with that, we build with that, we shape our environments with that, uh, in a communal manner, in a collective manner. Uh, that, again, is an ideological thing, which I will come later. Uh, so this uh, producing things, artifacts, the idea of artifacts, uh, the city, the architecture, the urban space is the largest, the biggest, uh, the most comprehensive artifact of all these other artifacts. So it's a shell, it's a container, um, it's a pot or mold or of, of uh, human life, uh, human order, uh, non social order. It's the biggest pot, actually. Uh, so you produce these uh, in form of uh, urban spaces, uh, and we live in them uh, as a community. Uh, so it's it's the pot of this communal living. Now I will uh, talk about the second mechanism, which is the crystallization. Uh, of course, it is related to the materialization uh, mechanism. Uh, you might know from your uh, early uh, stages of education, the crystallization is a chemical uh, process with the molecules of, of uh, any matter are kind of transformed under the uh, different conditions like pressure, heat, etc. And they crystallize uh, and they change, they transform their status. So we call this crystallization. Uh, that means 
they uh, take the shape, a specific shape under specific conditions. Uh, they occur naturally as uh, those conditions change, or we have some catalyzers, uh, like we can see here, the hand coming into this uh, liquid, uh, and this hand will become something else, uh, which will become the invisible hand of Adam Smith, uh, as we can uh, proceed with the presentation. Uh, so all matters from liquid to solid, from abstract to concrete, they crystallize, they solidify. Uh, so all uh, cities, uh, buildings, urban spaces are some sort of crystallization, solidification of sociality. Uh, the social existence of humans are crystallized in form of uh, cities. So there we can read what kind of a social order is crystallized in a specific form. In that sense, all ideologies are kind of crystallized through uh, buildings and spaces, etc. So that's going to be our argument. And uh, how this mechanism occurs, here we can talk about uh, three aspects, the strategies or tactics or games of materialization, of the idea or, or ideology. Uh, in that game, uh, there is this playing with symbols, syntax, and grammar to secure, to ensure the impact and endurance of that materialized idea, which is the ideology in our, our case. And the thirdly, uh, the controlling bodies and senses and perceptions to manipulate the meaning to enhance this ideology, the message. So these three strategies uh, work together. So uh, in so, instead of going them separately, I will uh, discuss them as a whole. So I will uh, continue with this subtopic, like urban architectural space as a chessboard, a playground for uh, solidifying societal struggles. That's what it is all about, this mechanism. The, the social struggles are kind of solidified in form of urban spaces. Since it is a social order materialized, it uh, solidifies the uh, social struggle. And in that sense, uh, the space, the architectural space, urban space can be conceived as the chessboard itself. So I will uh, carry this discussion along this line. Um, life, I will start with the life. Life is about a creation. Uh, I mean, I'm not simply talking about a religious uh, perspective. It, it is a creation. And the life is contained within the womb on our birth. And that womb is carried out through our uh, existence, through our settlement on earth in form of architectural urban spaces. We keep, my argument is we keep repeating our uh, periphery in the womb uh, to secure our uh, safe existence. Uh, and in that sense, human life, daily life, is a very bodily, uh, very physical, uh, existence. Uh, people lie down, jump, uh, roll over, um, run, etc. It's a very physical and bodily activity to exist on earth. Uh, we eat, we celebrate, we dance, etc. That's, that's uh, how we live. That's being human. But at some point, something happened and uh, the cities have changed into this, skyscrapers, and highways, etc., and uh, humans became like this. We only go from uh, our car parks to our shopping centers, to our gyms, and uh, from elevator to car park, etc. Our bodily ex uh, existence is reduced into these simple activities. 
three or four activities in Turkey. And in addition to this uh, craziness, we have to normalize this. So we have our devices of our phones all the time. Uh, we have our earphones, so we isolate ourselves, ourselves from this madness and we become content with this craziness uh, and we pretend to be happy. But it, meanwhile, a majority of people on earth, uh, the masses of common people, uh, have to struggle with their life, with their daily life, again, in a physical and bodily uh, format uh, in terms of their bodily involvement, bodily struggles to survive, really. Uh, these are the images from the majority of humanity. Uh, this is the condition how they are living. Uh, and in this bodily uh, involvement, uh, we can remember that uh, we, we are one of the species on Earth. And uh, if we look at it, I mean, we built our environment, our building, quite similar to the way they do. So it's a, a code of information to coexist uh, on Earth. But we kind of uh, forget that uh, for a long time. And uh, this bodily performance especially starts with the agricultural revolution that when people start to uh, work the Earth, their involvement, their existence on uh, the earth, the soil was quite bodily. And secondly, it was very geometric. It started with a line to process the earth uh, to grow their uh, food, actually. As we can see, it is very linear existence by using the body itself. Another thing, when they gather, uh, in terms of a social order, again, they were geometrically uh, involved in terms of a circle, uh, with the central uh, source of existence, which is the fire, which is the food, whatever, and with the equal distance of uh, people facing each other, taking their responsibility, and with the equal distance from the source itself, uh, it's a very collective order and it is the representation of that social order in terms of geometry and in terms of bodily experience and involvement. So, uh, and that is reflected in architecture too, whether uh, it be in uh, terms of street forms or in terms of uh, nomadic tents or pantheons or whatever you call it, or uh, urban plazas. That social order, that bodily uh, involvement is expressed in the city. So my claim, as I said, that we keep repeating our uh, shell uh, in the womb over and over again, uh, from a cave to the urban square, we keep repeating that because it is a coded information of existing on Earth in a collective social order. So that's the default. Uh, I will claim. Uh, in that sense, since it is a very organic thing in that claim, uh, cities with its seasons can be considered as spatio-physical organisms. Uh, and these organisms have their own DNAs, their own characters. One city in uh, Latin America is different from uh, a city in Central Europe, for instance. Uh, so they have their own DNAs and, uh, and humanity have kind of mapped uh, these DNAs in time. And especially with the 20th century, and especially after the uh, Industrial Revolution, people had the ability to manipulate, to intervene to this DNA, uh, the urban DNA, let's say. And we started with uh, the experts who are the architects, planners, etc., uh, they started to uh, intervene to the DNA, but those who were in charge were the politicians, leaders. So we will come to that point. 
uh, the the hand again, uh, like the, the hand crystallizing as a catalyzer of the uh, crystallization process. And now the hands of an expert, the professional of a politician are kind of uh, manipulating the crystallization process. Uh, the traditional city uh, where the bodily uh, existence and the material existence of humanity is reflected in the traditional city with the heights and uh, three-dimensional existence of this uh, physicality uh, is expressed. Um, but the modern city uh, is totally bodiless, let's say, and it kind of is reflecting a different social order where humans, my claim, humans are still bodily creatures. Uh, but our physical environment are pushing us to be something else. So, and the uh, humans are becoming uh, perplexed, puzzled uh, in the middle of this uh, struggle. So, uh, these uh, ideological operations through architecture are surgical uh, interventions and genetic mutations, the DNAs of uh, urban uh, settings, actually. Uh, how did that occur? The simple collective bodily uh, and geometric uh, existence of humanity is transferred from this regular daily uh, common uh, operation, is transferred to gods, its representatives, to the hand of gods this time. How was that achieved? This simple geometric act was transferred to the representatives of gods, the divine architects. And they were using uh, astronomical information, blah, blah, to, to implement the simple geometry where uh, people used to do it ages and ages ago in form of Carlos de Comanche. So it was a divine intervention by God to uh, implement a city on, in the name of an emperor, a king, whatever. So this went on and on. So what I'm claiming. Oh, there is problem. This through through its representatives. Uh, uh, we, cannot, Sorry, is there a question? we cannot Sorry. there is a connection problem so we cannot hear your last two really? minutes. Yeah. Okay. Is is it okay now? No, it's okay. Yeah. For so me, do you want me to go back for one slide? Is that no, is no. that enough? No, 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 no. It was no, just no. for a few seconds. Seconds. Okay. So what I'm saying is, what I was saying is that actually uh, I might sometimes repeat myself, so don't worry about the missing parts. <laughs> Probably I've said it already. Um, so I'm saying people were using this uh, this process of implementing themselves geometrically uh, for ages and ages, but they were doing it collectively. Now it is given. To, uh, to an elite, to the power, to the kings, to the emperors, and they were doing it via the hands of an expert, a representative of God, architect, whatever. So that's the difference. And that changed the social order. That's what I'm going to uh, claim. Uh, here, the point of uh, game is important uh, because it's an age-old thing from all over the world, from all cultures, and it's a system of uh, movement, uh, etc. But it is uh, op it operates on an um, Cartesian uh, order, Cartesian platform. So uh, the game is not a joke. Actually, it's a very serious thing. 
and all these uh, games like Monopoly, which distributes land and uh, power, uh, is, is based on that uh, Cartesian system. Like all other games, actually, even football is, is a very uh, tactical uh, game, as you know, and it comes from <laughs> the arena, uh, the, the struggles in the arena, which kind of absorbs the social pressure uh, in one uh, controlled space, uh, which <laughs> actually interestingly turned later into urban spaces, public spaces, plazas, etc. So these games are quite similar to the city planning games that we play today, uh, because uh, these games are the games of two major industries, uh, the first of which is real estate, the second is the construction industry. So it's a big game. Uh, and that's why the world leaders are involved in it. Uh, and it requires from, uh, requires looking from the top. So all the leaders, famous leaders are in the planes or helicopters uh, looking down and they work with uh, architects because they, they look from the top as well. Uh, that, Probably that's why they choose themselves and they understand each other. And city planning is a, a game where handshakes are very important. Again, the hands are very problematic. I will come to that because it turns all the cities, all even the people into uh, commercial uh, assets, uh, not living environments. And in that sense, all our urban environments are uh, kind of turning into uh, ur urban observation and control centers. Uh, I will not go into details, but all these uh, mega projects uh, kind of uh, work for real estate industries and construction industries. But uh, beyond that, they work for uh, massive controls of uh, people. Uh, that's why, yes, it has, uh, it has to be seen from above, but uh, the crucial point is from which side you're going to play. Are you going to play on the right or on the left? So in that sense, chess uh, is an important uh, game. Uh, and we can see uh, from its formation, it accommodates a social uh, differentiation. The, the line in the back, refers to the bourgeois and the line in the front uh, refers to the proletariat, uh, the very expandable, easily expandable class, uh, the pawns, uh, the kings are in the back. And it's very similar to our many institutions like uh, football teams, <laughs> their owner is uh, on the tribunes and the guys are in line Again, the servants and the royalty uh, are in line, uh, or the slaves and the emperor who is going to decide whether they are going to die or live in a minute, but they, they are in line. So chess formation is the uh, representation of the social order. But again, uh, the chess board has opportunities, uh, zones, routes, neighborhood units, public spaces, it has possibilities of struggle and social justice still. Uh, it, it's such a game that even a pawn itself can resist uh, the uh, system, the, the powers. So uh, in that sense, uh, the playground as a tool for normative principles of modernity or democratic ideals of modernity, it was a very important uh, element as the chessboard itself. Uh, and from Hippodanus to uh, Descartes, the, the logic is always there. Uh, many cities are built in that. And even uh, new vision for uh, Paris by Corbusier was using this uh, logic, as you can see how uh, radical the intervention was. Here we see the hand of the architect again as a major actor in 
in uh, changing the urban environment. So uh, urban, uh, urban architectural planning uh, is a test game, but now I'm coming to Adam Smith, uh, the, his uh, book, The Wealth of Nations, and the discussion of the invisible hand, that's the ideal thing that's gonna regulate the uh, whole world, uh, which brings us to this uh, stage of capitalism, actually. Uh, so his invisible hand was not invisible, actually. It uh, kind of had its fingers from politicians to businessmen, religious leaders, military, bankers, media, etc. So it was not a, invisible at all. And it was uh, mostly seen, especially with Thatcherism, uh, in 1980s, and here we can see uh, slowly I'm coming to uh, German and Turkish uh, connection, where our leaders, Turgut Özal uh, of Turkey at the time, and Hamad Kohl uh, at the time, were kind of dancing with Thatcher like everybody else. So uh, our changed, transformed DNA uh, today is uh, kind of the result of all these days. So urban space uh, is a chessboard and the game itself is a class struggle game uh, where kings and pawns are so clear in our environment. These uh, radical uh, inequalities are so visible and our urban scene, as you can see at the bottom and at the top, they are very similar in showing the uh, inequalities in terms of urban rights. So playing this chess game is important. Uh, and the question is how uh, Ataturk uh, in the foundation of the Turkish Republic was playing this chess game. Uh, so uh, if we look at the social orders quickly, uh, I mean, the political systems, how they express themselves through architecture. Uh, this is a scene from Moscow. You can see the projects uh, and the build forms. Again, uh, communist architecture, uh, Karl Marx Hof housing settlements. Look at the scale and the geometry, etc., and how uh, public spaces were kind of. Uh, elaborated for the sake of public, etc. Or if you look at the different uh, social order, imperialism or monarchy, you see forms and uh, scales in a different understanding, fascism. Uh, likewise, you can see uh, many uh, characteristic examples uh, and all of them are uh, tools of control and domination of masses of people. Uh, and liberalism, as we see today, uh, is turning uh, these inequalities into physical forms. Uh, and globalism, which we uh, currently live in, uh, kind of uh, makes everywhere similar to each other. You cannot differentiate from one place to another. Uh, so the question, how was the mechanism of architectural language used in establishing various ideologies? by architecture. Uh, let's remember the mechanism of this twofold mechanism. And here uh, we have uh, basic geometries, uh, square, circle, and triangle. Rob Clear kind of classified all these in uh, urban space. So these three geometries are the major tools. But when I see them like this, I, <laughs> uh, I cannot stop remembering the squid game, uh, which uh, a game, a person through a game controls people's lives. Uh, so this geometry reminds me of that control mechanism as well. Uh, and uh, if you look at the urban organizational schemes, the linear, circular, and griddle uh, systems are visible. But is there a specificity? That's the question. Is there a specificity uh, in the relation between an ideology and a geometry? Can we say that circles are democratic, uh, rectangular, or blah, blah? Can we say that? Not really. Um, the point is 
uh, how scale proportion, the rigidity of underlying order and the magnitude of repetition uh, defines uh, the social order, the ideology. If there is a monumentality, rigidity, repetitiveness, monotony, then we can perceive that there is a totalitarian regime and its idea and its idea behind that uh, physical formation. So now I'm coming to the question uh, of how these uh, two relatively different uh, uh, contexts overlapped. Uh, how was the mechanism of establishing an ideology via architecture used in the founding of new Turkey at the time, in 1920s? The question is that, and my answer is that the, the world was going through a process through modernity. Uh, it was uh, the product of the idea of enlightenment coming from 15th to 16th centuries. And it was uh, also um, nurtured by the ideas of revolutions, uh, starting from French Revolution to uh, industrial to Bolshevik uh, revolutions, and emerging new ideas of humanism, freedom, science, democracy, reasoning, etc. And all these uh, old issues associated with imperialism, of domination, suppression, etc., were kind of leaving the world. In that sense, all the empires were crumbling into nation states, and Ottoman was one of them. And uh, like other empires, Ottoman Empire, which occupied a massive geography, as you can see here, it almost covered the uh, half of the continent, uh, but after a certain point, it starts to crumble uh, because it was the time uh, that this massiveness was not possible anymore. So it kind of went back, uh, and I will not to, uh, not to consume my time. I'm just uh, covering up. So it turned into. Uh, Republic of Turkey. Uh, and it was, of course, a modernity project, one of the modernity projects at the time. Uh, and it was uh, a product of an in independence war coming after World War I, as you know from history. Uh, so the Republic was founded uh, and it carried a new economic order which was aware of uh, production, division, and sharing of uh, the product, uh, production. Uh, so uh, it also carried a new social order. It turned a uh, Middle Eastern country uh, into a contemporary one. Uh, so it produced new norms. Now we're coming to the issue of norms. That's where the uh, connection lies, actually. Uh, so it requires new norms uh, to form a new national identity. And I mean, he changed the whole language, can you believe that? I mean, from the Arabic alphabet to the Latin uh, system, he almost invented a new language. That language issue is important. To establish a new order, he needed a language. Similarly, he needed a physical setting, a new urban language. That's what I'm saying. Uh, that language, uh, of course, uh, required uh, a new understanding because it was a product of modernity project, and it required restructuring the public sphere, as uh, Habermas said. So uh, the normative uh, character and idealistic character of the new space required a new language and new uh, experts, actually. That's where uh, architects like Hosmeister, Janssen, Bonat, Stout, etc., uh, came into the scene. And uh, of course, it was not a coincidence. Uh, behind that new architectural language, there is a well-rooted philosophy. That philosophy, of course, was the Enlightenment. Uh, and it was not uh, an 
I know the class is discussed in the framework of uh, importing a new idea, but it was it was again a German terminology and excuse my uh, pronunciation, a zeitgeist. Uh, it was the spirit of the time. Uh, so uh, the enlightenment and the modernity was kind of uh, coming around for uh, this kind of uh, overlapping context. So if we look at the German Turkish uh, relationships, of course, they were allies in the First World War. So there was kind of uh, collaboration uh, between them. Uh, even before that, I mean, there were uh, in Ottoman times, there were collaborations, but uh, this uh, alliance in war uh, made it stronger. Uh, and especially after the World War, with the uh, independence war, uh, Atatürk as a modernist was founding uh, a new nation after being a military strategist. Uh, he became a statesman and a leader. Uh, and of course, we know that he was uh, breathing a lot. So uh, someone who, uh, who defeated its enemies as a soldier uh, in the light of, you know, um, interest. Uh, in, with the inspiration of French Revolution. Uh, now, as an intellectual, he was, of course, uh, influenced by Enlightenment, and he was uh, kind of uh, creating its own modernity project. And uh, as a, a statesman, he was hoping that his country uh, is based on freedoms, uh, reasoning, science, etc. Uh, so uh, the background for this is the Enlightenment, but we know that from the literature there are two, uh, let's say, streams or schools or tracks of Enlightenment, British and French thinkers on the one side and German thinkers on the other side. And uh, especially with the Lutheran understanding of uh, Enlightenment, uh, with figures like Schelling, Jacobi, Goethe, etc., especially Leibniz. Uh, the critical point is uh, the role of religion. Uh, when compared to the British and French uh, understanding of enlightenment, German um, Lutheran understanding didn't uh, overrule the religion completely. Uh, that's what literature said. Uh, so uh, I am assuming that he was uh, kind of, uh, sorry, I will just uh, show that. He was kind of uh, aware of this distinction. And it was important for him that uh, coming from a religious country, uh, Ottoman Empire, who was the caliphate, the representative of Islam on earth, representative of God, the Allah uh, on earth, was becoming a modern country. That's a big challenge. The secularism is a critical issue. So uh, he had to kind of, I'm not saying compromise, but go along with it, uh, with the religion. So the German thinking, this, this stream uh, was a wiser choice uh, to go along with. So the uh, intellectual shift and the institutional shift has occurred that our uh, collaboration in terms of uh, mental and operational issues uh, has shifted towards Germany. So our, um, our alliance has kind of uh, continued and the uh, uh, team uh, behind the uh, Turkish Republic was kind of going along with that too. Uh, and at that time, after the World War I, a new emerging situation, which will lead to the Second World War and after, uh, where, a, uh, where a world with two poles, Russia and United States, uh, was about to emerge at that time. So 
Atatürk was kind of analyzing the situation and uh, playing the chess uh, accordingly. And in that chess, uh, the crucial point is how to organize the chess board, as we said, uh, if you remember Habermas' um, arguments. And in that sense, all these German-speaking, let's say, architects, as described in the content of your course, was kind of uh, invited uh, into uh, Turkey to, to organize the chessboard, uh, to change the public sphere, to, to change the DNA uh, of, uh, of the country, because there was a new nation uh, and it was being shaped by architecture, uh, the new ideology, the new social order, the new political system, the new uh, national identity, all required a new state set, as Habermas said, uh, because uh, there was a normative uh, principle and a democratic ideal to transform the urban sphere. Uh, so, so that the idea uh, of uh, Turkish Republic has to be has to be manifest itself in the form of cities and architecture. So, architect uh, the, the Atatürk. <laughs> especially with Janssen, uh, was using their hand to transform the public sphere uh, to create uh, the newborn uh, republic and its uh, physical environment uh, in the sense that all this mechanism between uh, semiological issues and linguistic issues of architecture are utilized by uh, architectural means and it's interesting let's say let's look at this uh, that uh, Janssen plan was kind of uh, organizing two major axes one is called Atatürk Boulevard and the other is Inoni Boulevard and uh, they were referring to the two leaders uh, Inoni the main uh, general uh, shoulder to shoulder uh, fighting shoulder to shoulder with Atatürk. So, uh, and he was the second uh, president anyway. So their uh, names were given to these uh, major arteries uh, like the Cardus and the uh, So the axial planning language was kind of utilized. Again, the classical architectural language was uh, utilized. Of course, there were some local architectural language interpreted and kind of attached to this uh, classical uh, major language. Uh, in that sense, Kemalist ideology, as they call it, uh, was kind of uh, reorganizing the Öffentlichkeit uh, by, uh, by uh, using normative principles and democratic ideal uh, architecture so uh, that's what I'm going to say uh, thanks for your patience uh, thank you excellent lecture um, I very much appreciate that you expressed some really strong uh, strong positions clear and strong positions about uh, certain issues but before I start to make any comment, I would like to abstain from doing so and offering the word uh, to our group of students, whether they have any questions, if you are available to answer questions. Of course, uh, of course, my it, pleasure. So I, I would invite uh, the group to ask their questions. I would really wonder if there were no questions. <laughs> don't, don't be shy. We have him yes. here today. He's here to answer uh, our questions. How, how do I uh, stop sharing the screen so that I can see you clearly, but I couldn't this manage? just where you open this. Uh, there must be, if you go uh, there yeah, again. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I think I managed. Thank you. Yes. So, the floor is yours, students. Okay. Um... Thank you so, so much for that really nice presentation. I very much enjoyed it. Um, one of my questions would be, um, how did the, the public react to this change in general? So how was the public's reaction to this architectural change? Did they 
uh, go along with it or did they have um, issues with the pace maybe that it took that it was so quickly maybe um, so that was that would be one of my questions thank you I think that's an excellent question and as I said since I'm not an architectural historian uh, I might not answer that properly but uh, from the general impression uh, in our circles I can say that uh, or I can interpret that it was such a wind at the time of uh, the zeitgeist the uh, the spirit of the era was kind of uh, freeing themselves from the empire, uh, from the slavery, etc. Everybody was kind of so happy, except a certain segment of the society, uh, which is the uh, extremely conservative, even religious uh, uh, society, obviously was not very happy, uh, as we can see today. Actually, I will I will carry uh, the answer of this question to our day. Uh, but they were kind of uh, both because of the uh, spirit of the era and also because of the uh, power, uh, again, the power of uh, the founders of the uh, Republic. I mean, they were the military for God's sake. I mean, they defeated the whole Europe anyway. So, uh, so because of, the, let's say, let's say, the fear of the power, uh, they were silent for ages. Mm -hmm. uh, although they might be a minority, I mean, majority was happy. Again, the polls uh, say that uh, the majority prefers a contemporary life. But some segment was not, of course, happy with that. And as you said, the pace was unbelievable. I mean, it mm -hmm. could have been uh, spread into time, uh, but maybe it was not possible at the time. I don't know. I mean, I'm not an historian. I'm sure you will have other guests who can uh, answer that much uh, in detail, uh, in correct way. Uh, so that's that's uh, what I believe. And maybe we can come to another uh, question from that. Or probably it will come, but I will, uh, the language of the, uh, the selected language mm -hmm. of architecture and urban design was kind of seen as a very dominating and totalitarian in a way too, uh, especially today, uh, the current government uh, kind of demolishing all the heritage from early Republic period, all these buildings. They are trying to demolish that and democratic segments of the society are kind of trying to protect them because they see that as the manifestation of democracy, freedom, equality, etc. But they see that as uh, the uh, physical manifestation of uh, totalitarianism, uh, of empowerment, suppression of uh, religious uh, section. So I think it's it's there is no single answer uh, to this uh, question. That was my argument in the presentation as well. Thanks for your question. Well, it's, thank you. It's a very deep subject, which is uh, beyond me. I hope your uh, forthcoming guests can answer your questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Any additional questions? Yes, please. Hello, and thank you very much for a very interesting uh, lecture. It was really good. Uh, I want to add something, or maybe uh, talk about something that it always engaged my mind. To talk about uh, different language uh, in architecture, in uh, our interpretation for cities and for future cities, and something like that. But uh, I always think about that, uh, okay, for, for today's world, we need to express ourselves too. So uh, architects come with new ideas and uh, maybe sometimes it uh, have a totally different language with uh, the previous one. But um, I, I don't know, uh, I don't know who, who can control this because sometimes, sometimes just architects want to express themselves. 
like a, uh, like a star or uh, like a star architect. For example, I can remember Bilbao in a uh, uh, Bilbao museum by Frank Gary, Gary that uh, that creates something totally different with the atmosphere. And it was successful, but it was totally different and had very different language with other architects in that area. So I always can't uh, can't find which one can be better for the uh, place, especially when uh, we deal with a historical context. We had something to notice, but sometimes we changed everything, and it's always in my mind. So I want to know your uh, idea too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariam. Um, I think, again, that's another crucial uh, discussion that uh, what should be the new uh, language. Uh, that's why I keep coming to the argument that I uh, described at the beginning. I mean, humans uh, has some sort of encoded information. I'm not saying that we have to stick to that and keep it as it is without a single change. I'm not saying that, but uh, especially you uh, brought the issue of star architects, star architects and their free language, etc. Yes, uh, especially in our architectural schools, we are kind of fascinated by uh, this idea or he created this uh, forms, this design approach, blah, blah, like superheroes. Uh, but uh, if you look at it, I mean, they, they always as associate themselves with some sort of power beyond the society. This could be a leader. This could be a, a constructional uh, um, company or whatever, you know, uh, or a sector i mean brutalism do you think it was a brilliant idea of an architect brutalism it was a post-war context where the cement industry had to build millions and millions of uh, houses for demolished context so somebody has to shine up uh, concrete and sell it with a new package uh, as if it is a very good idea, a very uh, uh, creative design idea. No, it was an economic decision. But in architectural schools, we know Le Corbusier, what a, what a genius. Well, he was serving the uh, you know, uh, construction industry, cement industry. Brutalism is just an economic operation. So uh, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be easily fooled by the uh, mumbo jumbo of a design um, design context uh, design circles because we are so close to uh, ourselves and you know we talk like the world is about us so that's why i go back and uh, go back to the point where what is architecture what is building uh, what is urban space what is collective uh, thinking, collective existence on Earth. I mean, I think now we are understanding after so many disasters on Earth, we understand of, we understand the importance of uh, being collective uh, on Earth and how this capitalist system are kind of uh, destroying us. We, we started to see it. That's why we should have a, a different perspective on architecture and the bright uh, new languages of the uh, new architects, star architects too. So that's my position. I'm not saying that this is the right position, but that's my position anyway. So I hope I could um, uh, answer your question, Maria. Yeah, of course, thank you so much. Thank you. Alexandra. Whoever raised their hand. Alexandra did first and then uh, yeah. No, I, I didn't. <laughs> I think Sarah Sarah is whoever uh, whoever so, Sorry, uh, I got mixed up. Uh, Sarah. Sarah and then Ahmed. I, Hello. I, I, I so, yeah. Thanks for the presentation. 
Thank you. Um, actually, I'm curious a little bit about um, the current situation. How architects deal now nowadays with the results? Let's see. Let's, uh, let's say if it's um, yeah satisfied or um, the usability or how or, or how much it's sustainable the results which we which in the previous period mm -hmm. we have. Um, could you have any idea about? Can, can, can yeah. you a little bit elaborate on, I mean, one step further, can you elaborate your question? What, what do you mean by results exactly? Then I will answer. I mean, I, I mean, don't understand what you mean, yeah. but... Yeah. I, mean, I mean, with the new um, ideology, which ah. came after the period, after that period, and how, how much it's sustainable, let's say, the buildings themselves, the architectural... Uh, um, configurations which they bring brought with them mm -hmm. and how much these elements or buildings are sustainable and how how much um, what is the way the current architects deal with the situation or, or um, they use the buildings how much uh, going on the same way or mm -hmm. having other methodology or ideology also Okay, now I understand. Yeah. Um, thank you. So, um, especially, I, I have a problem with the word sustainability. First of all, I have to confess that because uh, I see sustainability as another mechanism of controlling as well. We can discuss it maybe in another presentation. That's another issue I know, but. Uh, your question, I will take your question not from sustainability point of view, but from ideological point of view. And I'm currently uh, trying to write a book about the current state and how urban uh, forms are uh, transformed, especially towards this metaverse, etc. cetera. Uh, how the current ideology uh, as the latest stage of capitalism, the extreme stage of capitalism, is turning uh, the lives of uh, people uh, into hell, let's say, uh, because, uh, yes, we see uh, kind of uh, nice buildings, strange shapes, interesting shapes. And as I said, we live in such an isolated uh, uh, configuration of spaces like shopping malls, car parks, uh, gyms, uh, plazas, office office plazas, and etc. So we live in that, and from one of them to another, we are almost kind of uh, beamed uh, with our cars, etc. Uh, so we don't experience the urban space anymore. Uh, that's the context uh, you are referring to, I believe, because uh, I don't know how uh, aware we are, but we don't see the urban space. We don't see the public realm. We don't experience it anymore. Uh, we can only go into spaces where we can, you know, pay our ID and uh, buy tickets, etc., and we call them public spaces. A shopping mall is believed to be a uh, public space. No, we pay for it. Or, you know, the, the security guys check us there. If we are appropriate, acceptable, then you are allowed. That's not public space. So there is a radical transformation which masses of people are not aware, but some, some masses are kind of... Uh, let's say, uh, suffering indeed. So the, the current situation is, is very problematic, I believe. And that's, that's because of the current ideology again, because we see capitalism as an you know, uh, only option that nothing can go beyond that. I mean, of course, we are, you know, we have, it's nice anyway, I mean, we have some, uh, facilities. I mean, we are in that kind of mood, but we're not saying that's 
we're not saying that somebody is exploiting us, you know. But Few people are exploiting us, and the, the architecture and the urban space are the product of that. Sorry, mm -hmm. yes. But you don't think that is in any way related to the previous ideology? I mean, uh, um, it's like the kind of results of the previous one, because it's based on the previous capitalism was or, or... That's a very good point. I mean, again, that's another uh, discussion point. Maybe we can have another <laughs> appointment for discussing this. Uh, yes, as you said, this is not new. Modernity, although it was like uh, an idealistic uh, philosophy, ideology, freedom, science, reasoning, blah, blah. But now we understand that it was the root of capitalism anyway. Uh, that's a long issue, but I, uh, I want to congratulate you that you are aware of that and the capitalism is not new. It started with industrial revolution and this whole uh, new package in 1920s that modernity is gonna save the world, such a social uh, justice thing. It was, it was a lie and uh, now we are uh, kind of suffering the result of that. I think you're absolutely right, thank you. Tuba. Thank you, too. Um, Hello, to Hello to As I know that you're one of Avian's inspiring teachers. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, didn't, I, I thought you would say something. Uh, I find it really interesting some comparisons also in your presentations, like the public uh, space and the containers, etc., or the um, status and like this enclosure feeling. Uh, and also like the statement that uh, the city urban space is the uh, customization of sociality. I find it really interesting. And uh, like when we, we said also like uh, that architects or like the, uh, the ones in power have like these uh, powers to change like the DNAs and especially in the context of Istanbul, we see like, like these two uh, like fighting roles like left, right, etc. And uh, question maybe it feels like how sustainable is that also like for the society, like how uh, it's so uh, harsh sometimes. Like it was uh, at the beginning of the Turkish Republic also like that. And now it's also the same harshness, but in another like uh, way. It's somehow the same thing that uh, still appears. And, um, question is what will actually happen to a society like that uh, between those worlds and always like those fights i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, it's a question uh, that we can answer like that but it's, yeah, I'm, yeah i mean I, i'm not i'm not a prophet so i don't i, I cannot see what's going to happen but if it goes like that uh, it will be worse. I mean, it's obvious, as uh, as Sarah was saying. I mean, it's, it didn't start yesterday. So, if you look at the whole picture from the beginning uh, up to now, uh, if if nothing changes, uh, it will be much worse. And I'm I'm going to discuss that in the forthcoming book that we're gonna lose the public sphere totally. Uh, I'm sure you are familiar with uh, uh, Urge's book, uh, Non-Space, non lieu uh, in French, Non-Space. Uh, that explains how, uh, especially after 19th uh, and in the new millennium, how urban space is eradicated and it's, it's a non-place. I mean, everywhere is the same and there is no definition of space. That will uh, that will get worse, and we will have only. And pandemic was kind of a simulation for that. We're gonna live in virtual spaces only, and it is promoted like it is something good. Oh, we have access to everywhere, blah blah. You know, 
uh, but it's a disaster. I mean, uh, it's like a dystopia, actually, uh, which will uh, result in the loss of public space, which many people have to live in because they don't have access to facilities, or computers, internet, etc. They have to live in the street, but they will be like in this dystopian movies, they will suffer uh, in this uncontrolled, uh, unshared public space. So um, my, uh, my vision is quite negative if nothing changes. But if, after all, so many things, if people, especially young people like you are aware of the process, maybe things can change and we can reclaim the public space as, uh, as communal uh, entities rather than uh, capitalistic individuals. I hope I could answer. It was a difficult question. Yeah. <laughs> it was a very difficult question, thanks. More questions? I saw a hand before. I saw the Ahmad's hands. Ahmad, too. yeah, Ahmad is there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Actually, I come from Iran and we had almost the same parallel process yeah. in creating new spaces and new ideology. Uh, do you think that this process went through the whole community of the Turkey? I mean, the old cities, even in physical aspects. In the same procedure because uh, we know that it started uh, to divide people and the community in all aspects uh, into uh, two lines based on how they are committed to their former ideologies mm -hmm. specifically in terms of Islamic culture which was uh, previously the essence of living in our communities but after that like Ataturk and in Iran King Reza yeah. they're um, trying to somehow remove it and its traces from uh, the cultures so how do you think these uh, phenomena in uh, physical aspects and ideological aspects left trace on each other and how they kept continue in our cities Yes, thanks, Ahmed. Uh, I think, yes, Iran is a very good example. And uh, Ataturk and Shahriza was uh, quite parallel in terms of their approach. And I think they were the two uh, representatives of the modernity project of the Zeitgeist uh, at the time. Uh, they, were, they tried to transform uh, the social order, uh, but the religious content as you said, is there. Uh, and when you over suppress it, it kind of reacts in a different way and uh, turns both the social context and the uh, physical environment uh, upside down. Uh, the beginning of your question was uh, kind of uh, asking, uh, has it occurred all over uh, Turkey in all cities? Uh, it was something like that. And I uh, I can say yes and no at the same time. Yes, uh, the general character uh, was kind of uh, reflected uh, throughout the country because um, it was it was a project and it has to be consistent everywhere. But uh, especially uh, under the uh, uh, under the influence of the power and it it. Uh, if we go back to the 1920s, Ankara, you will discuss in the forthcoming uh, lectures, I'm sure. Ankara was selected as the core representative of the new order. So Ankara as the capital was uh, totally designed with this new understanding. Of course, these German speaking architects built in other cities as well, especially in Istanbul. But Istanbul was representing the empire, the old state. So Ankara was the um, climax of, of the whole thing. So it was uh, concentrated there. Similarly today, uh, like Sarah said, I mean, 
that day is resulting in today. Today, that capitalist understanding uh, has a different form. Now it concentrates on Istanbul, which accommodates almost 50% of the whole economy and uh, a quarter of the whole population. So now the new understanding reflects itself in Istanbul. So it's not equally distributed throughout the whole cities of the country. Depending on the ideology and it, its uh, chosen location, this choice is obviously economic choice. I mean, all the finance is in Istanbul now, so the, all architecture, all new architecture is in Istanbul. But in 1920s, uh, the new country was looking at the Anatolia, equal uh, distribution of sources, etc. So the focus was in Ankara in Anatolia. Istanbul was sort of neglected. So it's a, it's a contextual thing depending on the um, spirit of the time and economy of the time. Uh, so that's my uh, view on that. I hope I could answer you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Additional comments, questions, statements, whatever. <laughs> yes, this. Yes, hope this is my last question. <laughs> I'm writing a paper actually on Hermann Janssen, and I wanted to understand his idea and theology behind uh, trying to combine German and Turkish architecture. So, uh, according to your opinion, was he successful in doing this when he built this new ideology? new construction, new vision of a new city, of a new nation. And is his legacy still present? I mean, are there any more architects following his example nowadays, or he just built what he, what he built and it is, it is as it is at the moment? Um, wonderful questions. Um, again, uh, they are actually beyond me because I'm not an architectural historian, but uh, from an uh, urban morphological point of view, I can interpret uh, some of the things and I hope I can answer your question. Uh, for the time being, Janssen could be considered a successful planner, uh, but uh, very quickly it was understood, and that's in literature, that his projections were so limited for a city that is about to grow. I mean, that was obvious that you know, uh, it's going to be a capital of a new nation, but his projections for population, etc., were so minimal that that plan couldn't work. Uh, not even for a short time, actually. Uh, when it comes to, but uh, the experts might answer, I mean, in, the, in your forthcoming classes, the new guests might answer differently, but that's my view. Uh, in terms of his legacy, uh, as I said, it's, uh, his legacy is uh, read or perceived as political and ideological. That's why his legacy among architects, among planners who are after a democratic society and a democratic uh, set, physical setting are kind of uh, elevating his ideas even now. Oh, yeah, Janssen's plan is very important. Oh, we shouldn't destroy this, this etc. But the, the main idea behind that, it's the philosophy behind it, because he was, uh, he was the architect, the planner of the republic, the democratic republic. All uh, today's needs and today's perception of physical environment, especially with the current government and this current understanding is totally different. So whatever is happening uh, is against the principles of uh, both the early republic and the planners of the era. So uh, we kind of, as democratic uh, experts, let's say, we kind of uh, try to keep his legacy. But uh, it's it's not only because of its planning success, its ideological background, that's why. I, that's what I can say. I hope I could answer. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. 
Any other question? <laughs> After your presentation, this is a very hard uh, session. Ask direct question directly and you, you answer. That's right. I, I, I like it's it. Not that there are not any questions. There are so many questions. <laughs> the problem is to pick one, one out of a thousand. <laughs> Lovely. I, I like it. Well, I actually have three things now to say. First, first of all, I would like to say that the discussion, I really liked the participation. That was maybe the first time ever that I did not have to push start the discussion, no? that it started all by itself, and I could just sit back and listen and follow. No? So if you have anything else, after I make a few little remarks or comments, uh, you're welcome to do so. I actually have one statement one wandering and one question. The <laughs> statement is that uh, I don't see the future of the city so negative because I see that people still like to dance, to hop, to jump, <laughs> to run. But today they don't have to run to get to work or to get somewhere. They can do it more easily and they run for fun or the weekend or just to be fit. So. I, I'm, I don't, would not say that the people don't like to, to dance or jump or hop anymore, no? That, that's not lost. Maybe it's okay. not so necessary, it's not a necessity of life anymore, but it still happens. So I'm, I'm quite positive about uh, the future of the city, but I agree with you that the common space has totally lost its, its role in the city, you know? We have forgotten that the city is a common house no? And there are no common rooms anymore in this house. The, the spaces between the buildings are just empty spaces. They are not shaped. I, I often teach my, my students when we do design project that they have to give a shape to the emptiness. Yeah. Empty, get, shape the empty space. Not just give a shape to the buildings, but shape the, the empty, the, the air, the body of air between the buildings because those are the rooms of the common house that, uh, that the city is. Um, the wandering was, um, and I can say this as the only person in the room who has some sort of German roots, I, I can say this, I wonder if really the enlightenment was, uh, was so much the, the reason why they preferred the German current of philosophy to the French or English or American one. Uh, I have a suspect that it was also uh, the German effectiveness, that they saw the, the new planning and construction of the city as a technical operation, and seeing mm -hmm. that the, the Germans were good in, in building machinery and heavy industry and getting the job organized very quickly with all the problems that it involves. Maybe this and also the German tendency of mysticism in okay. connection with the religious question in Turkey, no? because the French Enlightenment was, was not mystical, not at all. But Germany, Germans, and still today they have it, a tendency of mystifying and uh, yes. secretness and seeing things behind uh, the things. Maybe, maybe that, that's an aspect, but we will certainly come back uh, to this. And the question was, you explained that the brutalism of the 1960s was something created by the cement industry, putting it shortly, no? So yeah. today we are all talking about minimalism. Everybody likes minimalism. Everybody's proud about a minimalist design. So in your opinion, what is behind the minimalism of today? Is that also uh, something that the market uh, is dictating or where does it come from? <laughs> okay. Shall I start? <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, thanks for your comments. Uh, and about the wonder, I will come to the question anyway. About the wonder, I, I certainly uh, agree with you that efficiency uh, is the key point. And for me, it's a default. That's why I didn't mention it at all. Yes, that's the main reason. Which, which only is a myth, no? It's not a reality. 
I don't know. I don't know. I mean, yeah, uh, I know because I have lived in other countries and everywhere yeah. I met this myth, no? Well, yeah, but in Turkey in it works Pardon? because our, our systems uh, don't operate, but German ones do. So in our, in our country it works. It's not a myth. Uh, but mysticism point is, is crucial. Uh, and that's what I was trying to uh, emphasize. Uh, I think the correct word was mysticism, and I couldn't find it. Thanks for that. Uh, the, the difference between German uh, enlightenment and French and British is the mysticism point, and that was critical uh, for for a new republic, which was which had to associate uh, between modernism and religious uh, issues. Okay. So uh, I totally agree with that. Uh, about minimalism, I think again uh, it's it's related to uh, economy again uh, because with with a less with a less material uh, you um, you give a lot of meaning branding to an almost non-existent thing. It's a sheet, but it's so valuable. I think it's the representation of our era. There is nothing, but there is a change value in terms of Marx, Marxist uh, reading. There is nothing, but you can sell it to the maximum price. That's our era. And I think that's why minimalism works and it's the representative of our consumerism uh, to the extreme. So, <laughs> similarly, I can read minimalism in that sense too, uh, if I can answer your question. That's my view on that. Okay, very interesting. Just to put that right about the effectiveness, no? The German yes. effectiveness. Look at how long it took them to build an airport in Berlin, no? Yeah. How many years? 12 years? 15 years? I don't remember. I didn't even count the years, no? So I, I, I insist that it is a myth. Uh, is, it a, is it a German uh, company or is it an international consortium? I think it was mostly German. The architects were German, for sure. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, it was a German company, yeah. But I think they got hampered in their own effectiveness. No? There was a sort of Babylonic language uh, distance between all sides involved. No, they were so they wanted to be so effective that at the end they were not able to talk to understand each other anymore. No, and that made go everything into tilt. No? I think in Istanbul they built uh, an airport as big in how many months? Short time. I don't know. Uh, it was quite quick, uh, but it was uh, it's crumbling into pieces now. Hmm. Yeah, it's flooding. The roofs are uh, collapsing. Uh, birds are kind of you know uh, preventing uh, flights, etc. It's a disaster. I mean, it was quick. Hmm. It was the biggest uh, blah blah, but it's the worst. So uh, that's uh, Turkish pragmatism. <laughs> Grimshaw, Grimshaw has. That, that's that's design office, right? They, they designed yeah. it, and after that, the contractors are building it. And we're not talking about the design itself. We're, we're talking about the operation. Uh, yeah. The Turkish pragmatism uh, ends with uh, disasters. <laughs> I've never used there, by the way. Uh, I use the other one already. Yeah, yeah. Okay, are there more open questions in the group? We're not such a big group, but that's a lovely group, and the discussion was very satisfying for me too. So, thank you all. Indeed, I mean, it was very nice. Now we have to thank you definitely. No, it's a pity we have don't have you here. It would now be the right moment to go and have a drink. <laughs> yes, it's not not possible. Maybe, maybe I in the future we will get a chance in the future to Hopefully. have you here. Hopefully. No, Hopefully, that would Anyways, be a pleasure. That was really interesting, very enlightening, enlightening in this sense. And uh, yeah, maybe Evan, you want to say something? Ah, uh, 
No, if about... you're distant, you can say things differently. <laughs> no, you're no longer in the same place. <laughs> yeah, it's a safe distance to say whatever you want. <laughs> Has she been your student or your colleague? A colleague. Uh, ah, okay. She was All a right. part-time assistant. Uh, she was uh, kind of assisting a few of my courses as well. Then uh, we worked in uh, competition teams together. Mm -hmm. That's where our real collaboration uh, mm -hmm. started. It's mm -hmm. more condensed. He's very. Actually, I have a question. Maybe it's a little yeah. in the margin, uh, but uh, for me, yeah, I'm a little curious about it. Did you uh, present uh, this discussion in other place before, or was this presentation? provided for this uh, classroom? Uh, of course, it, it, it's prepared for this classroom. I mean, I mean, it has to be integrated to the discussion of German and Turkish issue. That's why I had to start with... Uh, no, I mean the whole project of uh, the, the way modernity came to Ankara and uh, Ataturk tried to build a new space in Ankara. Because, you no, know, the way was... you presented it, you started with uh, a system of thinking first. Yes. Let aside the logic, how we, like, perceive the way you look at this issue. Mm -hmm. And you used several models of thinking about it. And you built a new thinking language and uh, started to answer the question through that language. It was very interesting for me. And I was wondering, uh, if, uh, but you, you several times you emphasize that you are not an architectural historian. Uh, and I, I, I think this method of thinking would be very useful in architectural his history. <laughs> I hope so. So that's I why so. I raised that question and I would like you to a little shade a light on it. <laughs> uh, thank you. I mean, since I uh, studied urban morphology, and I'm uh, looking into the politics of, uh, of urban spaces for quite some time. Uh, and it, I might say, yes, it is a model that I try to understand the current situation. Uh, so that's why Sarah's uh, question was kind of uh, fitting into the right place. Uh, that model helped me to look at uh, early Turkish Republic as well. I mean, I, as I said, I'm not familiar with this issue, but since I have that model and uh, Evin asked me to uh, give a kind of presentation here, then I took my model and I <laughs> tried to look at the same, uh, another problem with the same model. And I hope it works. I mean, that was a reading model uh, of the relation between politics and cities. So that model, I looked at 1920s, and that's what I saw. I hope it worked and uh, it was uh, reasonable for you, the audience. Of course, it was a new perspective and uh, very nice for me to hear. Thank you. Very kind of you. All right, then. We, right, we, okay, will, then. We, will, we will start to our second track and uh, Professor Murat Çetin uh, is the key point to connect the, the first two lesson first track to the second track. So uh, as you you saw in, in his um, presentations, uh, you saw some some similar or, or some same uh, photographs from the first uh, two lesson to connect the, the subjects to the directly the ideology issues and and the, uh, the German architects in Turkey too. So uh, after this moment, this lecture, we will start. Uh, uh, we will start our second track with this uh, background. Uh, we will uh, next week. We we have uh, two lectures. One is about uh, Ottoman Empire during the Ottoman Empire time. Before uh, and uh, uh, Ceren Göz, assistant professor Ceren Göz will give lecture about. Uh, from uh, she is a history uh, ar uh, architecture historian, by the way. Uh, his uh, her field is uh, uh, Ottoman Empire period, uh, specifically, 
and the Professor Fine uh, will give lecture about the German uh, German period, German architecture in that period. So you can compare uh, the, the time in general, maybe. So this was the the in between lecture. Uh, be, uh, in between lectures, the first track and the second track of our lecture, actually. Thanks, Mohit Chetan. Thank you. I'm delighted to be part of this uh, lovely class. Uh, Our pleasure. Thank you. Our pleasure. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Stop. Stop record recording. Maybe I did already.